dismiss to uh, their children's church. And I'm going to invite our scripture readers. We have multiple scripture readers here again this morning. And here's the thing. Uh, it's another lengthy passage, some 53 verses. And so here's the deal. We normally stand for the reading of God's word. Here's just part of what we do. But the, over, the, the, the main interest is always that we would be able to receive that word of God without hindrance. And so this morning, if the best way for you to receive that word is to stand and to receive it, Stand in your freedom and do so. If the best way for you to receive that is to have a seat, have a seat in your freedom and receive the word that way. I'm going to sit, but you stand. If you want to stand, you sit if you would like to sit while our scripture readers bring to us the word of God this morning. Uh, John 7, 1 through 52. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea, because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of booths was at hand. So his brothers said to him, Leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For not even his brothers believed in him. Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come but your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I am not going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. After saying this, he remained in Galilee. But after his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he also went up, not publicly, but in private. The Jews were looking for him at the feast and saying, where is he? And there was much muttering about him among the people, while some said, He is a good man. Others said, No, he is leading the people astray. Yet for fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly of him. About the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began teaching. The Jews therefore marveled, saying, How is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? So Jesus answered them, my teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory, but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. Has not Moses given you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? The crowd answered, You have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? Jesus answered them, I did one work, and you all marvel at it. Moses gave you circumcision, not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers, and you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision, so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. Some of the people of Jerusalem therefore said, Is not this the man whom they seek to kill? And here he is, speaking openly. And they said nothing to him. Can it be that the authorities really know that this is the Christ? But we know where this man comes from, and when the Christ appears, no one will know where he comes from. So Jesus proclaimed, as he taught in the temple, You know me, and you know where I come from. But I have not come of my own accord. He who sent me is true, and you do not know him. And him you do not know. I know him, for I come from him. And he sent me. So they were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him, because his hour had not yet come. Yet many of the people believed in him. They said, When the Christ appears, will he do more signs than this man has done? The Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things about him, and the chief priests and Pharisees sent officers to arrest him. Jesus then said, I will be with you a little longer, and then I am going to him who sent me. You will seek me, and you will not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, Where does this man, man intend to go that we will not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What does he mean by saying, You will seek me, and you will not find me, and where I am, you cannot come? On this last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, 
as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. When they heard these words, some of the people said, This really is the prophet. Others said, This is the Christ. But some said, Is the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from the Bethlehem, the village where David was? So there was a division among the people over him. Some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him. The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said, who said to them, Why did you not bring him? The officers answered, No one ever spoke like this man. The Pharisees answered them, Have you also been deceived? Have any of the authority authorities or the prophecy, Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Nicodemus, who had gone to him before, and who was one of them, said to him, Does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? They replied, Are you from Galilee too? Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. All right. Lengthy passage of scripture. We're just going to highlight a couple themes here this morning and make a couple of applications. <clears throat> Up first, uh, so we've had a stowaway in our house the past two nights. Where'd she go? <laughs> I think uh, Mark and Sue Bickle are out of town, and I guess Hannah, for whatever reason, not too eager to just spend the past couple nights at home alone, and so she must have crawled into a window somewhere and has been hanging out in Callie's room, which none of us dare to go into at the house, and uh, <clears throat> yeah, so she's been there, and so I saw them both in the kitchen last night and said, ah, great, there's two other people I can enlist for reading. Help pour Gianna out, who has 53 verses to read. You guys can help her out. And part of my interest in doing that, I don't know if you noticed, I probably should have had uh, readers who had slightly different voices so you could hear the distinctive things. They all sounded the same. But I don't know if you noticed, uh, Gianna read most of the narrator's part, including the words of Jesus, and then Callie and Hannah read the responses of the crowd or the responses of the authorities and the leaders who were there hearing what Jesus was saying and what he was teaching about himself. And if you were really able to distinguish between the voices, you may have heard, <clears throat> I think it was Callie was reading, the, or it was Hannah that was reading the responses that were, were kind of curious and, and were kind of open to Jesus and were asking questions and were saying that maybe this is the Christ. When the Christ comes, is he going to do more signs than this man has been doing among us? Or they've been saying, uh, you know, hey, look, the authorities have been trying to catch this guy, but they can't seem to get a hand on him. Is he really from God in some way? And then Callie was reading more of the voices that were more antagonistic. The voices that thought, oh, no, this Jesus is dangerous. This Jesus has no business saying the things that he's saying. This Jesus who's not fitting nice and neatly into their molds. All right, how can this guy teach when he has never sat under any teacher? Jesus says, my teaching comes from him who sent me. Or, no prophet comes from Galilee. They apparently forgot about Jonah and Amos, but whatever. Or, we know where the Messiah is going to come, well, we know where the Messiah is going to come from Bethlehem, and Maybe hadn't heard the stories that he was actually born. I don't know what, but right? So there's this other crowd that's really antagonistic. And here's the thing. Theme one that I want to highlight is that all throughout this text, like that is a very clear thing that John is trying to communicate. Right? That as Jesus teaches, as he explains to people who he is, where he comes from, where he's going, what he's up to, there's this divided response. Uh, last week, Raj preached and gave us a, a great reminder and a great challenge that what we see throughout the narrative of Scripture is that God draws near to the outsider, to those on the margins, to those forgotten or overlooked. God draws near to those characters in the biblical story that we'll probably reread and just kind of move on from because we're not exactly sure what to do with. 
and, and right, and which gives us then that strong challenge too, that we don't have the right or even the option to do with what the rest of society does and just sizes people up based on what they say or what they do or what they look like and says, okay, I got you figured out. We pigeonhole them. We put them into our boxes. We decide if that box is like my box or not and then we decide how I'm going to react to you, whether I'm going to draw near to you or hold you at bay. No, we follow the pattern of our creator. We follow the pattern of our Lord and we draw near in love to neighbors. We draw near and love to God, right? Okay. <laughs> I want to say but, but it's not a but. It's an and. And when Jesus speaks or when Jesus is presented to the world, it creates a division. We actually were talking about this in, in the men's group with, with Raj. You know, the, the part of the the, the, the thing we have to hold in tension is that in the book of John, there is, you know, I feel, almost feel like John, more than any of the other gospel writers, highlights that division and that distinction. Like John seems to be drawing attention to how in Jesus' life he fulfills the thing that he said. Hey, don't think I've come to bring peace. I've come to bring a sword. I've come to set man against his father, daughter against his mother, daughter-in-law against mother-in-law, Right? which is not him in any way condoning violence. It's just him stating the truth that as I come and as I present and as I teach and as I call, there's this divided response. And I think that this is a very real intention of John. He wants to show you this in this text. You know, and maybe we sit from our comfortable American vantage, 21st century vantage point, we say, well, okay, well, John, why do you keep harping on this division? Why do you keep showing us the divided responses of the crowds and the authorities and so forth? And it might be helpful. Remember who John originally is writing to. I mean, obviously, he had future believers in mind. But originally, he's writing to the church in his day and age, in his context. A church that is a tiny minority fringe group that is severely marginalized, severely placed on the outside, and is increasingly persecuted for their testimony to Christ. Increasingly persecuted as they choose to follow Christ, as he is drawing near, not just to outsiders, but is drawing near to those whom he knows is going to reject him, as he's drawing near to enemies. Right? And so that early church, for sure, is probably wondering, why in the world is this happening? Why in the world is we entrust our lives to Jesus? Are we being marginalized and outcast? And why are we now starting to face persecution and hardship and trial? Maybe starting to wonder, did we make the right decision? Maybe starting to wonder if some of the Roman gods that are being offered to them are more conducive to life than this Jesus who seems to be leading them into harm's way. And so John is saying, as he will show them, as he will say later, just as the world is hating me and is divided towards me, so they will be divided towards you as you give faithful witness to me as well. And again, I think it's good for us as American Christians to remember that in many places around the world, this is still, still the case. Oh, this week, every kid in the house knows what holiday is coming. In a couple days, every parent knows in the, in the house knows this is the week. We've got to brush our kids' teeth more intentionally because they're going to be loaded up with candy and cavity-causing things, right? Maybe also good to remember where Halloween comes from, right? It actually comes from the old church calendar, the old liturgical calendar. Halloween, All Hallows' Eve, or uh, what's the, the modern translation of All Hallows' Day? All Saints Day, right? All those who have been hallowed and consecrated and uh, sanctified and have gone on and are now in the presence of Christ around the throne, right? All Hallows' Eve originally came from All Hallows' Day, uh, which is the day after Halloween. Sometimes the day after Halloween, my family, I think we've mentioned to you before, we'll go up to the cemetery where my grandparents are buried and we'll just kind of reflect and give thanks to God for the ways that he has used saints in our lives to grow us, to challenge us, to lead us in love for Christ. And we will 
eagerly look forward to the day when resurrection is going to rob these graves of our loved ones, right? And, okay, so in the church calendar then, the Sunday after All Hallows Eve or All Hallows Day is... I'm forgetting the old Latin term for it, but anyway, it's the day where we remember the martyrs and we remember the saints who have gone on to glory through persecution and trial and in non-liturgical churches or churches that don't really adhere fully to the church calendar such as our own it's commonly referred to as the day where we remember the persecuted church and so we'll probably pray for the persecuted uh, church next week as well too and remember that still today the world over by any watch list that's out there, Christianity is still the most persecuted religion on the, you know, on, in, on, in the world. Right? There are more countries listed where it is not exactly safe to be a Christian than you know, any other religious identity that you might, might want to claim. Right? It's good for us to remember that around the world today, there is a real cost associated with following Jesus or at least to follow Jesus as he is on mission to a dark and broken world, or to live that pursuit of Jesus in any way publicly. And I think, even though we don't experience that level of persecution or trial or hardship now, yeah, it doesn't take too much for us to, you know, to see and to understand that to claim the name of Jesus, to follow Jesus with our life and our testimony, well, increasingly, there seems to be some, eh, you know, from the broader culture. Maybe you converted to Christ later in life, and that put you on the outside with your family, right? The family who maybe looks at you now is sort of strange, like you don't sort of fit in with us anymore and what we typically do because you've got this new thing in your life. Or maybe you're a young person and, you know, you're in the public school system and God is laying on your heart a friend who you know could really use the compassion the forgiveness, the love of Christ, but you know to step into that and to uh, live more publicly as Christ or to mention Christ or to invite people to Christ might get you labeled. It might get you pigeonholed as some religious nut. Or maybe, as seems all the rage among the young people nowadays, especially around here, you get labeled as a bigot, as a hater of people who have different sexual ethics or whatever, right? And so you feel that. And so maybe... Maybe the simple challenge uh, from this first theme that I want to highlight is, would be this, that if you are living your life and you really don't feel any of that tension, if you're following Jesus and you don't feel any of that resistance or opposition or any of that discomfort, maybe it asks, it's to ask the question, are we doing that right? Are we following Jesus rightly? Are we actually following Jesus the way the New Testament church was called to follow Jesus? Right, out into Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth where there is great resistance and opposition. Are you carrying Jesus with you as he is on mission to a world often in resistance to him? Okay? Theme one and challenge one. Well, the second theme might simply just be this, that uh, you don't do that alone. And to highlight this, this next theme... Um, it's good for us to set the context that, we, that Jesus finds himself here in chapter 7. What's the feast? What's the holiday going on in Israel at this time? Booths, right? The Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, this was one of the three great festivals, feasts in the Jewish calendar. Every family or at least every male, three times a year was expected to make pilgrimage to Jerusalem and to worship in the temple. And this would have been one of them, Feast of Booths or Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, it literally was a feast. It was a great celebration of two things. One, it was a celebration of the harvest. It always occurred this time of year, September, October, November. Well, anyway, back then, it, this, this time of year. And you're celebrating the harvest. You're celebrating the harvest of tree and vine, the fruit that God has provided. And you, and back in that day, you would have to construct booths or tents or mini tabernacles to protect this fruit that you're harvesting so it doesn't rot or wither under the sun or, or whatever. So it's a celebration of God's provision in the harvest that year. 
but it's also a celebration and a remembrance of the time when God led his people through the wilderness, led his people all those years when they were tent dwellers and they were just living in tents or booths or many portable tabernacles, right? That God was with them and he provided for them and he cared for them. He gave them food. He gave them drink. He gave them security and provision through that time where they were living in tents in the wilderness, Right, so it's a looking back. Uh, but then there's, there's this other thing about it too. The la- well, every day of the feast, there was this little ritual that they would do. And on the last day of the feast, they would do this ritual seven times. Uh, the priests and the people, they would march down to the Pool of Siloam on the east side of Jerusalem. And a priest would have this golden pitcher, vase, whatever, and they would dip it in to the pool, fill it up, and meanwhile the crowd would be shouting or singing from Isaiah 12, may you with joy draw water from the wells of salvation. And they would take this and they would carry it back towards the temple, and the priests would walk up the steps of the altar that was right there in the courtyard, and everybody had in their hands uh, a, a fig tree branch, or no, I, well, I might have been a palm. I think it was a fig tree branch and then a citrus branch. Anybody know the Jewish customs could probably clarify this. Anyway, they're waving this to symbolize the harvest, and then the guy, the priest, would get up and he would pour the water on the altar. They would do this every day, and on the last day of the feast, they would do it seven times. Go down, fill it up, come up, pour it on the altar. Go down, fill it up, come up, pour it on the altar. Go down, all right, on and on we go. And the water would just flow over the top of the, sort of the granite slate that was on the top, and it would trickle down the steps, down into the courtyard. Right? And if you know your Old Testament, especially some of the prophetic images that would look forward to this day, like Ezekiel or Zechariah, chapter 14, would look forward to this day when streams of water would flow down from the altar, would flow down out of the temple, flow down out of Jerusalem into the desert wilderness places, all the way down to the Dead Sea, where Zechariah is to the seas on both sides. And as it goes and as it flows, it's bringing life all through these dry desert places. I think I've mentioned to you probably several times before that you know, when we, it was striking when we went, when I was in Israel maybe a year and a half ago, and you went into that area in the Dead Sea. It was a fun day. We had a little extra free time, so you go into the Dead Sea, which is so full of salt that nothing can live in it, and you can just get in there, kick your feet back, and bloop, and you just float up, and you just sit there and read the newspaper all day because you're not going anywhere. You're just kind of floating on top of the water, right? But also in the free time, I like to hike around in the, it sits right against the Judean wilderness. So literally you could be on the Dead Sea, you turn around and you see the cliffs of the Judean wilderness behind you. And I, I got some time to hike up and around in there. And, and it's striking how there is nothing <laughs> there. Like you are literally hiking on dirt, stones, pebbles, and rock. There is not a sign of life anywhere except maybe where there's a little stream, maybe where there's like a ravine that comes down and, you know, the water has kind of pulled there and it's just kind of flowing down. It doesn't have to be much. It can only be an inch thick, maybe. And yet that one little inch of water trickling down through the ravine, man, it's like the contrast, the green, the vegetation, the plant life that's all, you know, flowing over this little stream. It's so striking. And it's this powerful reminder, too, that... uh, you, 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 you want to be near to that stream. Uh, you want to be near that stream for a couple of reasons. I think I mentioned to you one time I was out there too late. It was dark and I couldn't see any of the, I don't even know where the trail was. And so, well, the stream has got to go down to that lake. So you just follow the stream down. But also then too, like you can imagine to be disoriented into the wilderness, to lose your way, to be too far away from that stream. <laughs> You're in a heap of trouble. It was actually really striking. One day we, we hiked up to the top of, of Masada, which is this, you know, this ancient fortress that's really high up, right on the edge of the Judean wilderness. And you're looking out, and everywhere you look, it's just dry as dirt. It's nothing. It's just brown dirt. Except there would be these little streaks of green. And you knew, okay, that's a streak where there's just a little trickle of water. And it was just striking to catch this image like in person of 
this streams of life, life bubbling up in this dry, arid, desert places. And that's the picture here. Actually, in our text, it's a little confusing. The English, the ESV, kind of smooths out the text for us, but it's a little bit unclear whether here Jesus is, when he says here, hey, come to me, all you who thirst. Or, or if anyone thirsts, let him come to me. And he who believes in me, as the scripture said, out of him will flow waters of living, or living water, right? It's a little bit unclear in the actual Greek text whether Jesus is saying that out of him will come rivers of living water. Jesus himself. Like, it's unclear if the text is saying, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and believe in me, because as the scriptures say, from me will flow rivers of living water. Or if the text is saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me, and whoever believes, as the scriptures say, out of him who believes will come living water. You see the difference? If you pick up a half a dozen commentators, three will say it's referring to waters coming out of Jesus. Three will say, it, no, it's the living waters coming out of the person who entrusts their life to Jesus. I don't really care where you fall on that debate because the thing is, in John, there are multiple allusions to both being clearly the case. Right? Jesus in multiple times. Uh, it will say, like when he goes into Jerusalem, the first time. And he flips over the tables in the temple. And then he will say, hey, I tell you, destroy this temple and I'll build it back up again. Right? In other words, saying to them, I am the true temple out of which will flow life. Or there's plenty of times where Jesus will say, hey, as you come to me, the spirit will be at work in you, causing life to bubble up inside of you, like John 3, when he's having that conversation with Nicodemus, and he says to him, look, unless anybody is born of water and spirit, he can't see the kingdom, he can't enter the kingdom, he can't desire the kingdom, right? The whole bit. You have to be born anew by water and spirit. And when he says to the woman at the well in Samaria, I see you drawing water there. Come to me and I'll give you water that'll cause you never to thirst again. And he goes on to say to her, you know, a day is coming when people won't worship primarily on your mountain or that mountain down in Jerusalem, but they will worship in what? Spirit and truth. Or two weeks ago, after Jesus had said, I am the true manna that comes down from heaven. And he said then, the spirit gives life. And my word to you is spirit and truth, spirit and life. Either way, whatever the text says, or whatever it is, the text is explicitly clear here that he's referring to the Spirit. The Spirit that is both going to flow from him, but the Spirit that will also indwell his people and cause life to flourish in them. So much so that even if they be led into wilderness places, to dry, arid, desperate places, if they be led into harm's way, life-giving water, is bubbling up inside of them. Oh man, I had a wonderful opportunity. Friday afternoon, working on the sermon, struggling with the sermon a little bit. <laughs> because it's, you know, if you haven't noticed, John is very repetitive. Jesus always seems to be on trial, and Jesus is constantly referencing, hey, there's this spirit that's coming. You need to draw near to me and receive this spirit. Right, so I'm saying, oh man, how do I... Again, highlight Jesus on trial. Highlight the significance of the Spirit. And then I had this wonderful opportunity to sit down and have a conversation with a young lady from the church here. I'm not going to say her name. To make her uncomfortable, I'll let her share her story in her own time. But she's interested in becoming a member at Grace Church. And we just started to share the story. And she started to share with me how, man, there were really dark circumstances and situations at play in her life for an extended period of time. And she has had to walk through some really trying periods of grief and loss and pain and struggle. And then she was explaining how it was in precisely those moments that when she was angry, if anything, 
at God, that God met her in a very powerful way and caused her to have hope, caused her to have confidence, maybe even caused her to have a little bit of joy. And it was just such a great reminder to me that, no, you, yeah, you can never tire to talk about the wonderful blessing of the Spirit, right? We can never tire of being reminded of, yeah, the life-giving power of the Spirit that can come. And so even in our most desperate of situations, it's not necessarily that the situations go away or that the sun is covered up and we don't feel so much of the heat or that all of a sudden, you know, the harvest season, which is drought, immediately gives way to spring and there's water everywhere. No, but it says we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. He's with us with his comfort and with his life-giving power. And... Right? So not only is life flowing in us, but life can flow out of us as well, too. And so as we engage with others in desperate circumstances and situations, right, life-giving water might be flowing out of us, which is all the more reason why we don't have any justification to write off those who might be resistant, those who might see our testimony and almost assume enemy status towards us or whatever. We don't have reason to write them off because there is life-giving power now that is at work in you and flowing out of you by that spirit. And so you have every reason to follow Jesus as he is on mission to them because he is with you and he is filling you and overflowing you, is that a word, with his life-giving power. Let me just push that one, one step further as we close this up. One other thing I want to highlight, not a major theme from the passage, but it's a curious thing. There's interesting use of words. I don't want to call them play on words, but there's two, two times where there's interesting use of language here. The first one is in the beginning when he's having this conversation with his brothers or saying, hey, you've got to go down to Jerusalem and, you know, reveal yourself, show yourself, because this is what you're supposed to do. If you're, you're the guy, you've got to go show yourself, whatever. And Jesus says, you yeah, it's not my time. He winds up going anyway, but he says to them, no, it's not my time. You go up. It's not time for me to go up yet to Jerusalem. And I don't know if it's maybe because having been there, right, or at least understand a little bit of the geography of Jerusalem, like that going up to Jerusalem, it, it stand out, stands out as being a little bit odd. When we first moved to Delaware County, however many years ago, uh, it would get together with family, and maybe we would tell them about how, you know, we went up, we went up to the city and uh, got a cheesesteak. You know, went up to the city and walked around or whatever. And, and my mom would say, wait, what'd you say? I said, you know, we went up in the city and did this, that, or the other. Said, you don't go up to the city. You go down to the city. <laughs> right? Because my mom grew up in the Northeast. First several years of my life, we, we lived in the Rockledge section up there in, in the Northeast Philly. And so if you were going to go to the city, you always went down to the city. You don't go up to the city. Well, I live in Delaware County now. Actually, I don't even still know how the 95 corridor works. I guess I'm technically going over and, and up. A anyway, you don't go up, you go down to the city. I had a similar reaction, right? When you, when you think of coming from Galilee to Jerusalem, you're going down geographically. You could say maybe, well, Jerusalem, it's kind of up on a high, it's up on Mount Zion. Yeah, but there's some pretty high spots in the Galilee too. I think much higher. Either way, I wonder if there's not a little bit of a play on words here. It might not be. I might be reading too much into it, right? But it's going to be in a couple chapters where Jesus will come into Jerusalem for the last time. And some Greeks will come up to Andrew, Philip, and say, hey, we, we would see Jesus. We want to see Jesus. And it gets to Jesus, and Jesus says, ah, now is the time. For what? For the Son of Man to be lifted up. Which means what? What's he referring to? <laughs> right, when he's going to be lifted up on the cross and surrender his life for his people. Or the other play of words here is when he talks about the Spirit or where John says Jesus here is referring to the Spirit who had not yet come because Jesus had not yet been glorified. <laughs> Which is another curious term that should stick out to us because we know what does Jesus mean? We've seen it all through John when he talks about the hour of him being glorified, what does he mean? When he's lifted up and he's going to suffer and die, which is not what we think of glory, right? But this is his glory. This is the whole mission. This is the whole reason that he's here. 
It's so that he could literally give his life away for the redemption of his people. You know, or there's this interesting thing in the text where we, we, we consider this, right? The Spirit hasn't come yet because Jesus hasn't done this yet. The Spirit hasn't come yet because he can't come and indwell and inhabit unclean vessels, right? This same Spirit that would hover over the mercy seat in the back room of the temple where no one dared draw near except one guy, one great high priest, one time a year. This same Spirit can't just go and fill up inhabit, indwell, unclean vessels. No, first, the blood of Christ needs to be shed, needs to be poured out. That blood of Christ needs to purify those vessels. That blood of Christ needs to make atonement for those people. That blood of Christ needs to be shed to purchase the full redemption of his people from sin and defilement. That blood of Christ needs to be shed to provide forgiveness The blood of Christ needs to be shed to reconcile these enemy parties, God and those who are in rebellion or treason against him. That blood of Christ needs to be poured on that altar and trickle down the steps and effectively render that uh, that altar now obsolete because it's the final sacrifice. It's a final atoning payment for the redemption of his people. In other words, there's this wonderful, uh, man, let's not miss the fact that as we read this on the back end of Pentecost, as we read this on the back end of that spirit being poured out and that spirit coming and indwelling and causing life to stir up inside of us and through us, let's not forget that that has only come because Christ has first come and shed his blood, and poured his blood for us, and has has come and made full and final atonement, and sacrifice, and redemption, and reconciliation, so much so that if you've entrusted your life to Jesus, whatever you bring to him today has been forgiven, atoned for, paid for, fully reconciled. Amen? It's a reminder, too, of the depth of Jesus' love, Right? That that spirit would come. Well, first, Jesus had to love his people enough to lay down his life to suffer and to die for them. You know, and, and, and I think this is the other thing that the spirit does. The spirit takes that love of Jesus. Right? Jesus will talk about this later as he's talking to the, you know, the disciples. He will say to them, not just abide in me, but abide in my love. Right? And this, this is spirit language. This is what the spirit does. The spirit takes the love of Jesus, pulls it out of the abstract, or just a thing that we talk about, or an event that took place 2,000 years ago, and sinks it deep into your hearts. So it makes it a lived experience. Right? So that as you are called to walk through wilderness places, as you are at wit's end, and as you are suffering under grief and loss or pain or trial or opposition, whatever it is, right? There's that love of Jesus that ministers deeply, fills you, cares for you. Ed Evans, you know, and then I'll preach a sermon, and in the afternoon, Ed will send me a a quote from Spurgeon, who will say the same thing I said but way, way better. (laughs) So Ed, I'm beating you to it. I'm going to quote Spurgeon here this morning. On their highest tabors, it's a mountain in Israel, he loves them, but equally as well in their Gethsemane, when they wander like lost sheep, his great love goes after them. And when they come back with broken hearts, his great love restores them. By day, by night, in sickness, in sorrow, in poverty, in famine, in prison, in the hour of death, that silver stream of love ripples at their side, never stayed, never diminished. Forever is the sea of divine grace at its flood. This sun never sets, this fountain never pauses. Yeah, he says it better than I do. (laughs) Right, but so if you're here this morning, wouldn't consider yourself a follower of Jesus, a believer in Jesus. You know, there's many ways to take a step, you know, whatever towards Jesus, whatever. Maybe today, just the simple challenge or the simple question I would throw to you would be, hey, you know, do you, do you find yourself sometimes in those circumstances of life that feel like a dry, arid desert? 
where it just seems like life, whatever that means, joy, comfort, meaning, purpose, whatever, it's just really hard to find. And do you ever notice in those moments, man, you're just desperately looking to the left and right, whatever, to grab hold of something that will give comfort, that will give joy, that will give meaning and purpose and hope in that. Do you ever notice that sometimes those things that you grab onto, they become enslaving, they become destructive, they rob you even more of life when you thought they would bring comfort or hope or whatever? So maybe this morning, the call, the invitation to you would be not, okay, as you consider Jesus, let me try to rationally make sense of Jesus. Let me see if this works, you know, if I can wrap my mind around. Maybe just this morning, just listen to what Jesus says. And he says, if you're thirsty, come to me. If you're thirsty, just entrust yourself to me. I mean, just try that this morning. (laughs) Like, come to Jesus in this posture of humility. Jesus, I don't have you all figured out. I don't know if you make a whole lot of sense to me right now. I don't know if I'm a believer or whatever. But you say come, I'm going to try that. I'm going to come to you in my desperate hour. I'm going to submit myself to you. I'm going to yield myself to you. And I'm going to ask you to help me with joy draw water from the wells of salvation. And then you come to him and you stay in that posture and you come to him the next day or whatever and and just see what happens. See if Jesus is good to his word to supply life-giving streams to you in the midst of your trial. And to the rest of you, rest of us, you've entrusted your life to Jesus. I don't know, simple takeaway, stay near the stream. (laughs) Don't get too far off course. Stay near that stream. Yeah, the Spirit's been poured out. It's not just a one-time event. Do you realize what you're walking around with day in and day out? Sometimes I need people to slap me on the head and say, do you realize that the Spirit is with you? Do you realize the well of water and power and resource that has been poured into you and you walk around as if, eh, no, stay near that stream, right? Be wary of pride. It says, I got this. I can go off. <laughs> oh, man, stay near the stream. In times of trial, times of grief and loss, stay near the stream. In the times of doubt, in the times of struggle and wrestling with sin, in the times where you feel enslaved to this wretched stuff that keeps pulling you away, move near the stream. In the time where you feel like, all right, I've got to follow Jesus, but I'm facing resistance, I'm facing opposition, there's fear, there's anxiety, it's coming, just stay near that stream. And as Jesus says... (laughs) I think water will flow out of him, it'll flow up in you, and even flow out of you. Stay near the stream, and may God add his blessing to you. We ask in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.